from an early age you're told you can't do this you can't do that then that type of mindset that we just discussed is not like an ideal you know mindset it's not even feasible because you've already you've been shown that that's not going to work out for you don't even think like that oh you can never get that opportunity you can't drive a car like that i mean that's a materialistic view but it's just like yeah. goals that are attainable you that's know don't even set for yourself you know um and i think that having a visual representation and even more so having a personal connection to someone that is a representation of that like just shows like yeah you can do that This is the Beware How Show, mystic philosophy made practical. I'm Bob, speaking weekly with Scott and Ryan. We're three conscious creatives and formerly closeted mystics trying to unpack the inaccessible. According to the mystics, the truth cannot be spoken, but we'll try to talk about it anyway. Today is Sunday, August 2nd, and our guest today is Jason Ivey. What's up, Jason? Thank you for joining us. What's up? What's up? How's everyone doing? What's up, Bob, Scott, Ryan? How are y'all? Very good. Good to see you. Doing good. Doing great. I'm going to read your very impressive long bio, and then we'll jump right in. (laughs) Dope. Jason Ivey is an award-winning singer, songwriter, music producer, film producer, and entrepreneur from the south side of Chicago. Since officially starting his career in 2018 with the release of his first project, Jason has been consistently recognized by Reverb Nation as one of the top 40 artists in R&B. He's been featured in publications and films from Billboard, Next Showcase, USA, Chicago Music Guide, and Self Magazine. In 2019, Jason won the John Lennon Songwriting Contest as a finalist for R&B. He has a bachelor's degree in cognitive neuroscience and linguistics from the University of Pennsylvania, a bachelor's in biology from the University of Chicago, and international relations from the University of Cambridge. He's worked with NASA. And aside from the creative arts, Jason develops social emotional learning technology for students and is a strong advocate for underserved and underrepresented communities. Awesome. That is super impressive. <laughs> um, excited to jump in and, uh, and unpack that. Um, you know, I have a few questions for you, obviously, related to, you know, all this different work you're doing. Um, but first, tell us about yourself. Tell us about your background, kind of personal, you know, early professional and just growing up. I know you're young, but but you're already going. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, I've been moving and shaking since I was a kid. Um, I mean, my parents taught me early, you know, the the value of um, working on yourself, improving yourself, and just kind of absorbing everything around you. Um, so then by the time that I was two, you know, I could already read, write, speak, um, and then I was writing in cursive. And I mean, this stuff wasn't like, it wasn't like fun for me then. It was just kind of, this is what you have to do. And this is, you know, going to be part of your life going forward. Um, so, you know, they were homeschooling me since I was able to, you know, pick myself up on two feet. And then um, I started first grade at three and I tested, I think fifth grade, sixth grade at then at, at that time. So, you know, I kept going through school and they kept testing me. And at, at the time I was in fifth and sixth grade, I was testing college level for a lot of things. And they were, you know, deciding if they were gonna skip me all the way ahead um, or just let me progress as, as a normal kid. And my mom made the call that, you know, after skipping two grades already, I wouldn't be skipping anymore um, because she didn't want me to be emotionally, you know, stunted in terms of my peers and other kids my age. And, you know, you know what kids are, are into. Sure, yeah. Um, <laughs> they they uh, can be kind of wild. You just if, blow if you past get out of everyone else. <laughs> <laughs> she was but smart yeah, to mitigate exactly. that. Yeah. I think so. I think so. I was I was a little bit spiteful at the time because I was like, you know what? I could have had less school, you know, less time in school. That would have been great for me as a kid. But looking back, I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm glad because going to college at 16 was already, you know, kind of a hurdle in and of itself, especially being completely away from family in Chicago. I was on the, the East Coast for the first time. And um, yeah, just on my own. And honestly, I wanted to get even further. Uh, as you mentioned, like my back, background in Cambridge, I wanted to go over there for my first uh, degree. But no, no, Philly was far enough. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I mean, 
getting to college was kind of like a testing ground for a lot of the things that I wanted to continue to do. And music was one of them. The sciences are one of them. And I mean, I was just inspired by the sciences early on because my mom was a breast cancer survivor. Um, so, oh, wow. you know, I started out at U Chicago studying cancer bio and trying to understand all of that because, you know, that happened when I was a kid. I was like eight or nine when she was diagnosed. And, you know, you look at a word like that and you're like, what does this mean? How does this mean? You know, how's my life going to change after this? Um, so taking a course seemed like the perfect thing since, you know, academics have been drilled into me since an early age. I'm like, maybe I can understand it this way. Um, I got to Penn and I decided, you know, that's not what I want to study for the rest of my time here. Um, cancer bio is enough at UChicago, um, but maybe understanding the way people work would be a way to go. So um, I went with neuroscience after like, I think I declared it like my junior year, maybe senior year um, after taking a bunch of different courses. And yeah, the rest was history. You know, music was always there though. Yeah, very cool. Appreciate that background. Um, I didn't mention it in the bio. It's not, frankly, it's not in your bio uh, that we, you and I kind of co-wrote together. You, you sent me something. I added to it. But, um, you know, yeah, the, the being p passing everyone in school uh, at a super <laughs> early age is a big part of the story. And, um, you know, I guess just to kind of follow up about that, that aspect, um, you know, like what what's the secret? I mean, obviously you're just, you probably have a natural gift that's just, you know, you can't, that's undescribable, but like, um, I got a six month old, like what should I, should we be going through some study guides? Like what? <laughs> oh yeah. Oh yeah. Um, I would say, you know, my parents would play, play tapes for me when I was asleep. That was back when, you know, you would have a physical radio and you can like put in a tape and press play and then restart it several hours later. Um, but I think that it's even easier in this really increasingly digital age, you know, just go to a YouTube page and be like, oh, Spanish, four hours long introduction, cool, play that while the kid's sleeping. And I think that stuff like that, the subliminal intake actually does work uh, a great deal. Um, because, I mean, I kind of taught myself German that way um, in college. I would just play like two, three hour long loops and just in my sleep. And sometimes I wake up you know, thinking in German and not knowing exactly what I'm thinking, <laughs> which is a scary place to be. But uh, I'm like, what was that sentence in my head? I just go look it up. Uh, I think, yeah, I think that's the way to go. And my dad Very also like wrote books for me when I was a kid. So he just like write stories and put like my name into the story. And I think that that's another thing that helps kids to um, understand better, mm. just placing themselves in the story from the beginning. That's interesting to say that. I just read, there was just a, conference um that we attended uh our our team virtually obviously but they were talking about um the the power of stories over like mm -hmm. regurgitating information we retain you know a very small percentage i'm not going to make up the number of because i don't remember <laughs> but it was like a super small mm -hmm. percentage of uh you know actual regurgitation of facts versus like stories exactly. we remember you know yeah. it was like 70 or 80 percent of of what a you mm -hmm. know when you break it down that way and that's probably because of oral tradition you know thousands of years of human civilization we didn't have writing so you exactly. we use stories to communicate ideas but uh but yeah no i, I i'm glad you shared that because yeah, i'm taking notes and uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely i mean maybe another another note for uh, child development would be like to teach your, your child asl early or baby sign i guess they call it for, for that developmental age because you know, the, the vocal cords are still forming. And this comes from my, my linguistics background, but, you know, they're still forming babies babble for, you know, a number of months, uh, up to almost two years. But your your hands are very dexterous from the time that you're born. Uh, and that comes from, like, I guess, a primitive background. You know, if you put a rope in a baby's hand and ask it to hang on something, it's going to hang on it. Uh, and that's just off of reflex. So, you know, that the, uh, the ability to form those complicated signs are there. And then, you know, the, the thought process are there and you just have to combine those and to um, kind of develop that those language learning centers in the brain. And um, that'll be the foundation for speaking multiple languages, you know, early on. You have until like wow. six years old to learn as many languages as you can before that just falls off rapidly in the brain. And then it's kind of just hard work from there. So early on. Yeah. That is fascinating. I remember Very reading about there being like a, I guess it was like a, a theory in anthropology or, or like early uh, civilization that that uh, like verbal speech maybe grew out of like the dexterity of our hands because it like the, the, the subtlety of our fingers 
helped develop parts of the brain that then were used for you know tongues and, and lips and stuff like yeah. that. Yeah. So that's. Uh, I believe that. That sounds cool. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Nice. That's cool. You were also kind of using your hands to illustrate your. I point. know. I do it a lot. I just I'm always like <laughs> crap clawing when I talk. That's just a thing. I do. Yeah. That's great. It's proof. Awesome. Well, uh, yeah, Jason, I'm going to be following up with you on a bi-monthly basis here as my <laughs> child grows <laughs> to check in with you. Um, and I'm sure you're also, you know, you're, you're developing social emotional learning technology, which we'll get in, I think, later on uh, to, in this episode. But um, so so yeah. we'll circle back there. Um, okay. I like cool. how you are able to talk about like, oh, well, from my neuroscience background or like, from my linguistics back, you can cite just all these different avenues in which you've studied. Um, you know, tell tell us more about that. Like, I read something about Elon Musk and how he's he's probably the most famous polymath, right? If, you know, that's the term that we're probably. we're going over here. You know, PayPal, SpaceX, um, mm -hmm. and Tesla, obviously. Neuralink, he's, all that. He's, yeah, he's pretty busy, and and he, you know, he gets asked that question a lot of like. How do you how do you become an expert in so many subjects? You know, yeah. When you went to college, you started realizing, wow, I'm interested in this. Wow, I'm interested in this. Well, you knew that mm -hmm. earlier probably, but it formed more fully even in university for you to say, hey, there's all these different avenues um, to follow. Like, tell us more about that. Either, you know, kind of decision making yeah. process to pursue another thing, or you know, how do you how do you codify all of it? I think that. Um for, for a lot of individuals who are more socially inclined, and I, I would consider myself an extrovert, that um, a large percentage of the things that we do are compartmentalized. And that just kind of makes it easier to be like, okay, I'm going to a party, like this is my mindset. Um, or I'm going to the grocery store during COVID, I have a completely different mindset than a party. Um, <laughs> and I probably shouldn't even be mentioning parties right now. Um, <laughs> but like, I remember that's just that. kind of like, yeah, yeah, those <laughs> old things. I don't know if they're extinct now for yeah, what. But <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it's just like uh, being able to code switch, I think we would call it, um, mm. and just switch lanes just like that. I am, I don't know, from early on, you know, even back in like high school or maybe seventh and eighth grade, I had a hard time doing well uh, when, it, when it came to social endeavors if it wasn't a whole thing. You know, if it was just one or two things, I'm just like, okay. I wouldn't give myself any time to do it because I'm like, I have time to do this later. I can just, it's just one thing I can just, you know, put it off till, you know, I, I don't have any more time. I'll procrastinate, I guess is the word. But as I took on more and more things, it, it made me, it made me focus more, you know? So I guess I was more focused with 12 things on my plate than one or two. And I'm not sure how that logic works, but you know, it just, I'm like, okay, now I have to divide my time, you know, and prioritize and, and use all these time management skills that people talk so much about um, because I'm, I'm forcing myself to. And I think that's a way for me to hold myself accountable um, instead of just succumbing to, oh, yeah, yeah, I've got time to do this later. And then, oh, the assignment's late. Oh, I did this to myself, you know. Um, yeah. Sure. Just, so the motivation of like the higher expectation and like the higher need mm -hmm. and higher drive kind of creates an inertia almost that carries you forward more so that stagnation and, you know, lack of stimuli exactly. might not do. Yeah. 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 Exactly. That's not how most people work, but conceptually <laughs> I understand that. <laughs> I don't know. I just, I think it comes from a place also to, you know, continue that drive that was instilled in me early on, early on, just, you know, if there's something out there that I don't understand much about and someone, you know, brings it up in conversation, and I'm like, oh, interesting, you know, then I switch into a completely different mode. I'm like, all right, now I'm listening, um, you know, proactively. And when I get a, a second, I'm going to go home and just like open 30 tabs about that and read on it yeah. until I get extremely bored. And, you know, or I think that I understand it and or I found another avenue that I want to travel down. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. Super it's cool. just always been an insatiable need for me. Yeah, there's a joy nice in that. the deep dive on the internet. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Those hour-long <laughs> computers on those dead deep dives. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Hey, Bob, I'm wondering if you could define uh, polymath, because um, I don't know if I even know the definition of a polymath. Sorry. Yeah, I should have done that. That just means um, a wide range of knowledge across many subjects. Cool. Nice. 
um, you know, Da Vinci is probably the most famous of all time historically. Um, cool. Artist, writer, um, inventor, inventor, yeah, sketch, so on, so on, so on. You know, to the yeah, you tend to see Man. that cross between the arts and the sciences, which I I always love that interplay too, because I grew up with like yeah. two two parents in the sciences, and then they had me and my brother who both went into the arts, and like we both, oh, you know. We love both, and, and it's like, yeah, I find myself alternating between, like, music and programming, which is, like, seems counterintuitive, but I don't, mm -hmm, it mm -hmm. just, it feels right to me, so, <laughs> it's like. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I wonder if you could, like, code a program to, like, write music for you, that'd be dope. Yeah, well, I'm sure people <laughs> have tried, and, like, I'm sure that exists, and, and that's actually what got me into it, is I wanted to take some music and, like, try to create a music experience programmatically, where, like, it. You know, it's taking into account, like, you know, phone or, you know, like whatever device uh, movements and stuff. But, yeah, it's like there's a lot of interplay, of course. That's what that's what that's oh, yeah. where it gets interesting to me is the cross pollination between subjects. It's like that's when new stuff gets invented and like new ideas are mm -hmm. had is when you're when you're sharing between uh, these these seemingly separate yeah. subjects, but that are actually very, very related, uh, very related at the core. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, tell us, uh, tell us about your music project. Yeah, it's amazing. I know by you the have. Way. I love that that music you sent me it was oh. incredible. Or uh, sent us. Was yeah, incredible. thank you. I was really enjoying it. It's really thank good. Uh, I'm excited for it to get published and put on Spotify, <laughs> so I can add it to playlists. <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm waiting for that too because I can only hear it on SoundCloud, and I'm like racking up all these plays to myself that aren't going to count down the line. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Right. Um, um, yeah. yeah so t tell I, us about the uh, output. You, I, I know you had you put out. You put out early stuff a couple years ago, and now this is. Yeah, I know you're like sitting on, I think two LPs right now, or what? Yeah, yeah, yeah where are you exactly. At now? So uh, yeah, I'm sitting on two LPs currently. They're both ten songs in length. Um, and then earlier, I released two EPs. One was six songs long, and the other was just two songs. It was just you know something I had on my hard drive, and I was like, oh yeah, I can I can drop this today because uh, Bandcamp is doing a promotion, so I dropped it and people were like, oh, you dropped music? Like, even to, like, yesterday or today, you know, people were like, oh, I didn't even know you dropped another project. And I'm like, it wasn't really, you know, marketed or advertised. It was just to get it out there and off my computer. Um, but the ones that I am sitting on, I'm looking heavily forward to. I think that they'll be, you know, defining projects for me. Just because, one, I've never dropped an album, and I've worked on Stainy 2019. So it's just, like... I put 99 studio hours into these projects. I wrote all the lyrics myself. I had featured artists that are, you know, just unbelievably talented. Um, like this one woman named Shuba. Uh, she's, she went to the University of Chicago. She's from Michigan, uh, now out in LA. And I mean, just recently is being finally recognized for her talent on TikTok. She had a million uh, followers and, you know, publications all over LA are like writing about her because she was doing different covers of songs, like spot on covers. And I think that uh, the ideal thing would be for those people that, you know, she was covering to hear, you know, she did like uh, Megan Thee Stallion Savage in the style of Eminem and the style of Ariana Grande and the style of Celine Dion. And I think if Celine heard that, you know, she could just elevate her to where she needs to be. Super cool. Um, and just like meeting these people by happenstance. I mean, I, I dropped uh, my first single, my first studio single, Higher, on uh, SoundCloud and a bunch of different platforms. And Shuba just messaged me like, yo, I love your voice. Like, you know, can we work together in some capacity? And I messaged back like, how do I know that you're not a bot on SoundCloud? <laughs> <laughs> and she was like, meet me in person. And I was like, mm, uh, okay, this sounds catchy, but all right, let's do it. Um, and we met and she's like, yeah, anything that you need musically, let's, let's do that. And she ended up, we recorded like four songs in our first studio session together that are split between these different projects. And I think that it'll be great. And she's just one of the artists. So um, there's another one, Duran Bernard, awesome. who sang with like Erica Badu for 10 plus years. And uh, he's in the process of, you know, remixing one of my songs. And I think we'll probably make it the official version because he's just that good. So I can't wait. Amazing. So so you're, you're having kind of like synchronous aspects to the creation process where you're hitting oh, yeah. people in interesting ways. That's so you cool. Need to have, yeah. You need to have like cool friends that are good at what they do that are that want to collaborate oh, yeah. and and we oh, yeah. that cool stuff will get made <laughs> that's amazing oh yeah <laughs> yeah i that's mean exciting. the producers on these projects are like out of this world i mean so the cover art that's you know behind me is actually one of the cover arts from the projects and uh the guy who produced like the majority of that his name is matt sterling um 
he's relatively new to producing. I think he's probably been producing for under two years, if that. Um, and I mean, the stuff that he's putting out now is just like, I, you know, are you sure you've only been doing this for two years? Because it's, you know, it sounds like people that have been working on this for 12 years, like 20 years. Uh, and then the other guy, Chris Bivens, he's worked with a ton of people from Chica, who's been on like, you know, late shows and Kehlani and, you know, Hank, you know, like veterans in the R&B field. And it's just like, I'm blessed that they're just supplying me with a constant stream of like music to record to. And I actually just finished setting up my home studio, like probably 3 a.m. So it's just like, <laughs> now I'm finally getting back to my roots after being stuck in quarantine and not being able to hit the studio for since February. Just made me Got, realize yeah, that I need to. Got to have a reliable yeah. home studio, especially now. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> so for your music, are you um, you're mainly working with producers then uh, who are kind of making a lot of the beats and you're singing are you adding any other instrumentation or mainly just singing or yes yeah, so, i mean uh for my first projects i started off it was like um 33 so like a third of the music i was writing um or producing myself and then matt and chris are producing the other two thirds uh, respectively so um now it's more that um one lp is produced almost entirely by matt and the other one's produced almost entirely by chris and then I take them, um, and if there's anything that needs to be added to them, then I'll, I'll add that production and myself and instrumentation. Um, nice. And then in terms of songwriting, yeah, uh, that's that's all me. I have I've, I couldn't really wrap my head around people writing songs for me because it's just like, you know, these are like my emotions and thoughts flushing out. And maybe I'll get to that point where hopefully, you know, I'm hitting stardom and I'm like, ah, oh, too many things to do. I can't write anymore. And you know. <laughs> maybe that'll be the case one day. But for now, it's just <laughs> I write songs on the fly. You know. I'll be working out and I'll write a song. Do you like, nice. when you're writing, do you like to sit down at a piano or what's your, what's your uh, approach? I can write anywhere. I mean, um, so my most popular, one of my most popular songs, Higher, um, actually wrote that at the gym. Um, and I had like awesome. no music or anything, no, no instruments, no equipment or anything with me. Um, I was in the middle of a set and I was listening to some stuff that I recorded earlier in the week at the studio on SoundCloud and SoundCloud does this thing that I still hate to this day that after your music playlist is done, they'll play somebody else's random music and you're like, yeah. what is this? Um, so like 20 seconds of the song played and I was like, nah, and I skipped it. But then um, some lyrics started writing themselves in my head to that random instrumental that I played on, on SoundCloud. So I was like, actually, let me go back to that. And um, within 15, 20 minutes, the full song was written, melodies, you know, cadence, tone, everything was written. And I just had to bring up my phone and I was like, all right, cool. I wrote it all down to Evernote. And then I messaged that producer who turned out to be Chris. And I was like, I want that, that instrumental. I, I need that. And he's like, yeah, sure. Take it. I don't really care about that instrumental that's on the back burner. Like do what you want with it. And I was like, all right, cool. And I think I got it for like a couple of dollars, you know, uh, looking back. And he's like, all right, yeah, like, let's see what you can do with it. And I dropped it. And the next thing you know, like OVO Sound is calling us, both of us. And he's like, yo, I just got a call from Majid Jordan at, at OVO. Like, what did you do on that track? And he's like, I'm like, you yeah, know, listen to it. And he's like, I had no idea that you're going to like, you know, record or throw down that way on the track. And he's just like, whatever you need is uh, I'll, I'll provide. And I was like, that is the best thing I heard all, all year. <laughs> That's so cool. Thank you. What a cool story. That randomized algorithm had a big impact on your, your, your creative <laughs> It destiny. really did. For the and first time and only. <laughs> right. True, true, true. That's funny. I like how your parents must have been super encouraging throughout your creative endeavors as well, because like, I feel like a lot of parents would be like, don't you think like you're good? Like, you know, like, be like, yeah, neuroscience, linguistics, biology, like maybe you're you don't need to be making records, Jason. <laughs> yeah, I mean that was my dad's perspective for the longest time. He was just like, I I got out of college and you know I've got my neuroscience, my linguistics, and all these all these different you know backgrounds and fields under my belt. And he's like, so you know what's what's your move? What what, what job are you gonna get? And I'm like, no, I'm hitting the studio, you know, tomorrow and next week, and I'm, I'm recording these projects. And he's like, um, you're not trying to use your degrees. And I'm like, I am in, in a very creative way. And he's like, well, uh, the police department's hiring. I was like, no, I just <laughs> neuroscience and biology. You want me to go out there and put on a vest and run around in the streets? No, thank you. <laughs> Get you a job, Jason. <laughs> right. No, 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 no. 
Uh, they're not saying that now. <laughs> Good. <laughs> You also, um, that's super cool and um, happy to promote the records when they come out. I know it sounds like you're still kind of making the final touches or final moves on what those releases look like. So mm -hmm. uh, good luck yeah. with all that. Um, Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah. I want to I want to talk a little bit, too, about um, your startup. But before we jump into that, um, NASA is most people are familiar with. How did you get involved with NASA? What did, What's the work that you did with them? So, yeah, it was kind of, again, by happenstance. And it's just, you know, applying myself and seeing what happens, what comes of it. Um, I don't even know what I was doing one day. I was probably just combing through opportunities on, on my computer, you know, one of those deep dives. And um, I just came across this opportunity that said, like, NASA is hiring, looking for, you know, people to, to work with them. And I'm like, okay, I, mean, I have a neuroscience background. I, I can't be too different from astrophysics, right? No, it is. Um, <laughs> but I'm like, let me apply and see what happens. Um, and they're just like, yeah, you know, we're looking for people to come out and see this launch. We're, we're partnering with SpaceX. You know, we're doing the Falcon 9 launch and we're doing a bunch of different things uh, social media wise. And we want people to have like extensive reach um, to partner with us and, you know, kind of introduce the topics of space and you know just exploration into those communities and then we'll do the same for them like we'll put you on our platforms and stuff like that and i was like oh this sounds like kind of social uh and not and you know less technical and i, was like, I can get with that um so i applied and it was, it was like hey you know how, how much reach do you have why are you applying like you know what can this program do for your community what can you do for us type thing and i'm like okay yeah uh, you know type a bunch of stuff out and i sent it off and then a couple of days later i get an email saying uh, you've been waitlisted. And I was like, all right, that's something, that's something, you know, um, mm -hmm. waitlist from NASA is not the worst thing in the world. <laughs> and I think a few hours later, they said, hey, Jason, we had a ton of, you know, really great applicants and the selection process is really hard and tough, you know, and we, we tried our best to consider everyone. And I was like, oh, you know, when, when a letter starts off like this, I already know that I didn't yeah. get it. And they're like, yeah, you know, unfortunately, we had to decline you and, you know, go with other uh, more suited individuals and I was like, okay, okay. And then like five minutes later, they're like, actually, no, we sent that, that email to you an error. We're so sorry. And I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> they're like, actually we accepted you. And I was like, oh, <laughs> oh so a roller God. coaster of, of like literally every response I could have gotten waitlist decline, except I, I got it all from them. And I was think like, NASA oh. would be, you think NASA would be a little more detail oriented? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I thought so. I'm like, how's this launch going to go? <laughs> <laughs> didn't expect the sloppiness yeah. on the, the, uh, the wait list outreach the <laughs> <laughs> True, no they actually did they did because of rain so they did wait list it you're right ah, well, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> that's so cool yeah, was, what was that what was that process like i mean um did you go to the launch and like share that with uh like the community what is like what does that mean or like how did that happen yeah so I was actually trying to coordinate because I had just come off the release of my EP and I was like, maybe if I could bring a film crew to the space station or not like the space station out there, uh, but like the, you know, the headquarters, maybe yeah. we can shoot like some type of really sciencey music video for hire because, you know, mm. this song is called hire. I mean, I that, <laughs> yeah. I'm like, it, it kind of goes in line with, you know, space uh, and just having a rocket launch and a music video Strong is something that fit. like, I feel like, yeah, yeah, exactly. No artist. It's an excellent do. production value there. <laughs> oh yeah, oh yeah. And I'm like, as long as our cameras don't like Who waste away by the fumes or anything. <laughs> um, How much did he pay for that? <laughs> <laughs> I'm broke That's eternally. Awesome. <laughs> um, I, I really tried to, um, but they're like, no, you know, we, we can only give government clearance to so many individuals, and you know, unfortunately, you cannot bring a crew down here. It's just yeah. you that has the clearance. And I was like, all right, so. Um, the, the worst thing about it is I actually got stuck in the airport that day of the launch in mm. Chicago. And, you know, mm. I was on like the first flight out of going to Orlando and I'm like, all right, cool. I was there like a couple hours early and I ended up being there for like five, six, seven more hours. And uh, that plane that I was supposed to be on had some technical difficulties. They're like, we got to change the tire. We got to do this and that. And I'm like, didn't know planes needed tire changes, but you know, this is not the day for that. So um, I'm like emailing NASA, like, Hey, like, can you delay the, the launch for me? And they're like, uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Who are no you? Son. And I was like, 
exactly so i'm just like uh um so sadly i missed that launch in person i did get to see it online and you know be a part of it and i'm still connected with the community like you know talking to astronauts on facebook is like something that i could do in my spare time um so but wild. i hope to once COVID is over get down there um and then actually film a, a video for hire i'm like still reserving that for nasa and actually they did approve the video they're like that'd be cool if, if you could just bring a camera yourself so i actually just purchased the camera nice um, right. a couple days nice. ago so i'm like you're in maybe... with the marketing people there yeah. Oh, yeah. oh yeah and i'm like hey i'll put this video out and i feel like it'll reach like millions and you know nasa will and spacex will be like on top forever uh after that like the cool yeah you letter. need me yeah guys yeah, right? <laughs> yeah you need me <laughs> Let's be, let's be clear here. <laughs> I love it. Well, I also, I think I appreciate your, like, I think the like, curiosity is one word there, but also just like the openness of like seeing how it'll unravel. Like, I think you've just, mm. you just, maybe it's because of your track record also. And like, you know, having a few universities worth of degrees and, and being successful musically very early, like, it's like i think it's all it feels like a state of mind almost that yeah. you're kind of operating in where you're like well i you know this could very well go well also you know i think most people mm -hmm. we just like human beings and the human condition is just like this is not gonna work Without. out for me yeah. and this is not gonna happen and da, da, da. and like you know it's yeah it seems like your own experience has kind of disproven uh, those mm -hmm. kinds of mental blocks that um prevent mm -hmm. a lot of other people from from yeah moving forward. I, I would agree i mean i think that a lot of people would be astonished that you know a 16 year old from the south of chicago made it across the world to you know the university of cambridge to study international relations you know that just is something that is unheard of or i mean because yeah. it's just like growing up going to high school first of all in one of the most dangerous neighborhoods in chicago like inglewood where you know, at, at the time, there was like this weird rate, like one in six chance that you would not like be injured, you know, or, you know, seriously harmed um, during your time there. And I was just like, okay, so I'm entering this, this field or this space every day for four years continuously. What are the odds if that one in six is just, you know, for a day, you know, that it's going to happen to me? I feel like it's one in one. Uh, and fortunately for me, it did not happen. Fortunately, I was able to go from that high school right around the corner to Hyde Park to, you know, one of the best universities in Chicago, really in the U.S. And then, you know, to Philly. And it's just like, these are things that are, are limitations that people, I guess, I guess really are circumstantially, you know, people from that zip code are not, you know, likely to go and have these exposure to these big opportunities, these life-changing opportunities. And even more so, it's just people in general i mean the, this is extremely selective but i think that if you keep an open mind i think that the universe works things out uh in ways that are unexpected and unprecedented um for you to just kind of defy records and, and set your own and i think that that's it is a lifestyle it is a mindset just being open Absolutely. and not doubting things before they even happen it's just like i don't doubt anything you know anymore and i think that that's probably a huge lend to my success it's just if I apply for something in my head, I'm thinking, yeah, I'm going to get it. And this is what I'm going to do after that. And this is what I'm going to do next, like four five steps down the line. And if it doesn't work out, then I just reorient. Oh, yeah. But I just you got to keep moving like 10 steps ahead. Yeah. Just staying open, listening to the universe and following the energy. I love oh, it. Yeah. yeah, that's oh, very yeah. inspiring to hear. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, listen closely, everyone. Remind, rewind that. You know that's really useful, <laughs> practical stuff. Um, you probably well. I mean, you mentioned the south side of Chicago and the the difficulties in that area. I mean, you know, your bio touches on this a little bit as far as you being an advocate for underserved communities. I mean, you, you must feel a sense of kind of almost like moral obligation or ethical obligation to 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 be you know an inspiring figure you know mm -hmm. to to especially young people who don't mm -hmm. imagine themselves you know i think adults we have everybody you know adults are one thing but like for the kids yeah. um that come up Completely, in an yeah. area like that i agree yeah if, if from an early age you're told you can't do this you can't do that then that type of mindset that we just discussed 
is not like an ideal, you know, mindset. It's not even feasible because you've already, you've been shown that that's not going to work out for you. Don't even think like that. Oh, you could never get that opportunity. You can't drive a car like that. I mean, that's a materialistic view, but it's just like yeah. goals that are attainable, that's you know, don't even set for yourself, you know. Um, and I think that having a visual representation and even more so having a personal connection to someone that is a representation of that, like just shows like, yeah, you can do that. I mean, I, I was out at a, I think this is like maybe a year, maybe in 2019, like after I got the NASA thing, I was out with friends at like a bar in Chicago on the North side. And my friend was like, yo, you just got accepted to like NASA, like this program is like huge. And he's like going on about it as we're in like the, the line to like pay our cover fee to get into the bar. And people are like, no, nah, they're like, they're messing around. And then like some girl walks up like, oh my God, I'm like, is he serious about like you being with NASA? I was like, yeah. Like, and she's like, oh, like I work for BET. And I was like, oh, well, there you go. Like, let's talk. <laughs> Just like wow. just random occurrences and it's just, you know, I don't know, just people talking about it in, in an inspiring way and, and showing people that there is more to do. And he's also an artist himself. Um, so it's just like, yeah, like once I get more of um, myself and my, my, my future, my success established, then I'm going to definitely try to, you know, build programs in my own communities that allow people to experience the same things that I've experienced. Because I think it's only fair, you know, it's, so many things have been done wrong historically to especially the south side of chicago and residents therein that you know there needs to be some sort of reparations if you will um and if that has to come from an internal um factor of the community then it's just like so be it you know we got it's got to be done for the kids at least yeah yeah we're we're a podcast of three white men but we're aware <laughs> We also, we did a social action episode a few ago, um, okay. you know, kind of going with the current racial movement for, you know, combating injustice and inequality mm -hmm. in America. Um, you know, it's, 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 you know, troublesome in some ways, but it's also, you know, for, for some people to, I think, have to like come to this awareness or come to this real the fact that it has to take place is unfortunate yeah. but it's so yeah. overall like it's so damn useful for the country right now to have this moment of contemplation and reflection and say like wow the his history in the past ain't so good and you know it, it mm -hmm. seems like a, a lot of white americans are um, you know, having a moment of reflection and contemplation, hopefully, and uh, you know, hopefully. try to undo the systemic fucked up injustices that have been perpetuated yeah, yeah. against people of color. And, um, you know, I think Chicago is no exception. Mm -hmm. So yeah, hopefully I think Chicago has some of the, we can make some, some damn momentum. Work. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah long exactly. History. Yeah, I, I feel like Chicago is they're like, oh, it's like this big city and, you know, second city and whatnot and but you come to chicago or you live here and you see how segregated it is you know there's a little uh country you know everywhere there's little italy little vietnam little you know chinatown there's um you know Pilsen, you know or i guess la la, la barra la, la barra it's just like so many different places that you, mm. you can go but you have to know how to how to survive and exist in those places um but i, I don't know i mean it's just it, the, the history is prevalent you can see the, the separation there and um, you can see that since inception you know it's it's not been fair so it's just i think this wake-up call was necessary to um to have and to have this moment i think that this is a very powerful moment that you know we kind of all hold up in quarantine to ourselves and we only have our thoughts with us you know besides right, family absolutely. members and, and little ones it seems like, to have amplified those. the anger because mm -hmm. you know Mm -hmm. George Floyd's murder was so just disgusting and brutalizing and terrible. And these other, and intentional. you know, victims yeah. and intentional and, and Breonna Taylor and Ahmaud Arbery and, you know, the list goes on. But um, on. I think yeah. particularly, you know, yeah, this moment right now in America and really world history, because it, it's the mm -hmm. guys in Europe or, you know, they're throwing the slaver statues in the bay in bristol england mm -hmm. like you know it seems mm -hmm. to be a very interesting kind of awakening moment for for everyone and um yeah i think that i think it's that's clearly related to you know oh, the, yeah. the stir craziness has amplified that oh yeah i mean i i got in my dms and on, on instagram um one of my friends who, who lives in court was like yo check out this song like one of my friends from Porto made this song it's for like the black lives matter movement and i'm like 
wait a minute <laughs> in portugal like <laughs> this started pretty much here Sick. you know in, in this city you know saying and how did it get all over there and you feel so personally inclined to make a song you know it, it must have resonated you know so deep into the earth's core that it's just felt on the other side you know so i think that we're we're changing the landscape so one of your songs was on a portugal blm yeah yeah that's oh cool. no no it was it was them that wrote a song from oh, portugal oh, right. about blm and i was like Got yo it. that's you know and they weren't even it wasn't even a black artist that's beautiful. Like, that's just, yeah yeah worldwide <laughs> yeah i oh, made yeah. a film about palestine uh for the couple of years you and i talked about that a little bit but um mm -hmm. gaza in particular is similarly persecuted by the state of israel yeah. and um there's a lot of solidarity and angela davis actually wrote her in her book freedom is a constant struggle she compares the movement in ferguson uh, missouri after mm -hmm. michael brown's death to um, palestinian uprisings in uh, the west bank and gaza and uh, you know there's a lot of camaraderie and solidarity oh between kind of you know, persecuted people of color uh, worldwide. It's, it's um, you know, oh, yeah. like the struggle is united among everyone that is experiencing it. And there's, I think the momentum grows through that connection. I think so. Um, yeah, Jason, I'm so fascinated by your story. It's such a, it's so cool to see what you're doing and kind of where you come from. I mean, yeah. I just, I lived in Chicago for four years. Scott lives there now. And, um, oh, dope. Okay. and, um, I know how, like, yeah, how difficult that is. Um, I mean, I can't imagine growing up as a black youth on the South side of Chicago and in those areas. And you just like, you seem like you have kind of figured it out in a way like you you just <laughs> yeah. are so positive and optimistic and <laughs> you're just kind of staying open and letting the universe take control and and guide oh, yeah. you wherever it takes you and i'm wondering is that did that come from your parents that kind of optimism of like you can do you know anything you want to do or is it something you developed on your own and um think, and then how does yeah. that relate to like your your peers too i mean growing up or did you was that mentality something that was prevalent um, even amongst your peers or was it the opposite of that or? Mm. I, I would say that my my mindset was probably unique amongst my peers growing up. And probably because, you know, um, you know, my, my parents are entrepreneurs, you know, they, they built their own paths. Like my mom put herself through high school and college, you know, on her own cool. dime basically because wow. uh, she had to work from an early age, her parents, or I guess her father died when she was 17 and you know, even when he, he was alive, he was only making like a janitor salary. So it was just, you know, from, from time, you know, immemorial, <laughs> basically, she had to raise her own funds to fund her own education and, and make her own opportunities happen for her. So that's just sort of like that, that starter mindset that was, you know, put into me before I was even, you know, on the earth. It was just kind of something that's in my DNA. And I mean, my dad, mm -hmm. like I said, he wanted me to be a police officer, but that's definitely not you know uh accepted or, <laughs> or not kosher uh in this climate but it's because he was mm -hmm. himself a, a police officer uh for 30 years and then you know on the other side in the art side he had like a, a limousine business and stuff like that so it's just like he was connected to a professional and also the art and creative side of chicago um mm. yeah i mean I, I i remember this t-shirt that i would wear when i was a kid that said you know carpenter you know that you could make anything um and then there's another one that was just like you can I can be whatever I, I set myself to be or, or whatever I choose, whatever path that I want, I can create for myself. And it was just like t shirts like that that I can remember that I would wear when I was like two or three. Um, but like I would I would look at those and I would look at myself wearing those in the mirror and be like, Oh, I you know, this little animal on the shirt, it could be me, you know, I'm saying like, it's it's a carpenter, I could be a carpenter and I think that these words can apply to me since I'm wearing the shirt. Um, mm -hmm. I think the subliminal messaging really has a strong part to play in yeah. forming your early opinions of yourself and where you can go and how you shape your destiny so yeah I super think, cool yeah. and that's actually a yeah. perfect transition into your work with the you know social emotional learning we talked about emotional intelligence which is uh, mm -hmm. dan goldman's kind of groundbreaking work in modern psychology and how you know behaviors are tied to emotions and um you know, the psychological component behind that, how, you know, are you, are you implementing kind of some of what you were just talking about in your work uh, with the startup and, and uh, you know, how does that apply to some of those emotional learning 
yeah for sure tools I, I think that um first of all I, I think that i apply like you know concepts that are, are prevalent in neuroscience psychology like all these different you know behavioral sciences fields um i'm applying that into my music uh one and i think that it helps people to process their own emotions because you know they hear that and they hear what i'm saying and they're like oh interesting but they don't know that it's been processed through like an academic mindset as well as a creative and you know hmm. kind of um cathartic mindset too it's just like yeah this is great to get out but then i also like form the lyrics in a way that are in line with like actual leading you know <laughs> ideologies um, i'm pretty obsessed with like, lines by the way yeah i really okay. like lines a lot and <laughs> it makes me very happy and so hey. now i realize okay. that i've been manipulated neurologically <laughs> yeah i'm sorry i'm sorry to tell you i mean if you listen to glass animals you've been manipulated twice because <laughs> uh, the lead singer of, of glass animals is also a neuroscientist and i oh, think wow. that you know this, this yeah. yeah this like cross talk of like the arts and sciences yeah gooey i love that yeah. song. i love that song. Yeah, yeah uh the production value is just unmatched there um hmm. but yeah i mean just like i don't know and then like tra transitioning that into a startup and uh, the start, by the way, is called Strut Learning. Um, and yeah, we create emotional intelligence technology and social emotional learning technology. And we try to like build that into the curriculum for kids as early as like, you know, third graders and even the students of life, I call them, you know, adults. Um, because I think that anyone can benefit from being emotionally savvy because that it, it's not taught in schools. There's no course that says, okay, here's how to manage your emotions. It's like, here's how to like study psychology and then people try to use right. that and like be like oh yeah i am the master of my emotions and yours and i can diagnose you because i'm a psychologist and it's like no you took one course <laughs> um <laughs> but i think that emo emotional intelligence and and other types of intelligence kind of dictate that you know standard academic intelligence and, and bodies of knowledge don't translate well into social spheres all the time. Yeah, I w I'd like to know even a little more. I appreciate that background too, but um, you know, I think from from a pandemic virtualization mm -hmm. perspective, you know, there th mm -hmm. there's been rumblings like Khan Academy was like really changed a lot of education online initially. If people aren't familiar, yeah. Khan Academy was yeah. like he was like a he was making math doing math formula equations on video for his nephews across the country. And like, that's how Khan Academy started. And like, mm -hmm. it's now this massive, you know, it's just like yeah. an online Dude, learning like academy library. thing, yeah. library, right? Resources. Yeah, I spend a lot of time on there with my tutoring kids <laughs> for tutoring. <laughs> they're all, they're on there all day. <laughs> on Khan oh, Academy, yeah. it's perfect. That's beautiful. Yeah. And so that was an early one. And then um, now there's so many um, that are kind of, proliferating in this space and and i think the pandemic has um you know accelerated this also when it comes to <laughs> the virtualization and, and and i think it's we're due like I, I would say also american society in particular i don't want to speak for other countries but it's probably true I, I mean, scandinavia seems to be ahead of the curve there but most um you know world civilization like education format is very 20th century it's very like um factory assemble like be a good factory worker regurgitate the information and do it on timely and mm -hmm. be well behaved and off you go and like well no like like someone like jason was miserable in, in that environment you know we're not I encouraging yeah. uh kids and the youth to um you know transcend that or go beyond themselves where it's very confining basically is what i'm saying yeah and, no. and it's all um, it's all compliance based yeah um, and so it and must I mean, be a cool opportunity to, to help transform it with with this company yeah i mean i i think personally i i was miserable like you said um in high school i mean i finished the curriculum my sophomore year and um when i originally got to the high school there were two principals there and one was like wow I'm sorry, test scores, like you were college level at sixth grade. Um, you'll probably be done here in like one year, two years tops, and then we can send you on to college. And I was like, yeah, awesome. And then the other one was like, oh, I don't know about that. Maybe three and a half years. I don't know about two years. You know, that's just too, too little time. So luckily enough, uh, the principal who thought about the, the two years mindset transferred to another campus and became the principal there. And I was stuck with the oh yeah no three and a half years is gonna work for you guy and he was actually like you know what now that he's gone you're gonna stay the whole four years and i'm like 
okay so i remember you saying to, like, that there was like some bureaucracy in the, the yeah. level of you getting out and yeah 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 and it's just like getting um, out um, like a prison kind of. <laughs> it felt like it <laughs> it felt like it because uh i mean just just to paint a picture this is a, a high school on the south side of chicago in inglewood um the security guards are actually chicago police officers so it's just like yeah. there's this aspect of authoritarianism and it's just like you know you, you make one mistake you have one disagreement with a classmate and it's not like detention. It's not in school suspension. There's this threat of like this larger systemic issue in the school at all times. And I think that that was something that I didn't even realize because I was looking at it through the lens that my father was one of these guys. <clears throat> so I think that I'm protected by this institution, but you get older and you realize these are the same institutions that have been present since, you know, 1649. And it's just like, you know, you know, this just nothing has changed. And if to have it introduced into a school shows these kids that there are no second chances. Um, and I think, I mean, yeah, going back to like my curriculum, I was walking around the hallways for two years. Literally, I, I had nothing to do on, on my schedule. The only thing on my schedule was lunch at fourth period. And it was fourth or fifth. You know, I, I would sometimes try to go to lunch twice because I'm just like, I have nothing else to do. I might as well eat. Um, and then history. I had no other classes for two years, so I had to make my own schedule. I would go to the community college, Kennedy King. I would go to U Chicago, starting at like 13, and take classes there. And that's kind of how I started studying at these different campuses. I was like, I have nothing else to do. And the security guards that were new would be like, hey, why are you not in class? Like, you got to get to class. And I'm like, what class? And they're like, oh, stop trying to play smart with me. Blah, blah, blah. You need to be in class. Let me see your schedule. And I'm like, okay, I put my schedule out of my blazer and I unfold it and I'm like, here. And they look at it and they're like, is this a joke? And I'm like, how could I make my own schedule? Like, you know, that's not a joke. It's, yeah. it's like, it's blank. And I'm like, yeah, it's blank. I have nothing to do seven days mm. or four, five days a week. And, uh, you know, I'm just chilling. And he's like, wow, um, well, you can't just walk the hallways. Do you want to go to the computer lab? I'm like, I guess. Uh, I don't know what else to do. <laughs> so yeah, I'll be on Khan Academy, just like trying to teach myself calculus oh in my like God. 13, 14, like wow. hardest stuff in the world to do, but you know, trying not to be bored. But yeah, you're the like, perfect example that. for why the current <laughs> state of education is does not work, outdated, and irrelevant. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, we're trying to like build it so that students can learn at their own pace and yeah. also at their own level of emotional intelligence, because if you're getting frustrated with the lessons that are being presented to you because they are rote, they are memorization, they are routine, they're, you know, factory assembly, you know, mindset. And it's like, this happened in 1776. And then this happened in 1812. And it's like, no, what year did those happen? And you're like, 1812. And they're like, okay, yeah. you get an A, like, good job. You can now run a company. And it's like, right. oh, okay. Right. <laughs> uh, if you're frustrated with that and, you know, you're not learning anything new, you're not being presented with anything that can, you know, challenge your, your, your growth then you know you're not going to want to sit still for you know five six hours a day and try to absorb that information but maybe if it's being presented to you in a way that is in line with how you think and how you process things then maybe it'll just benefit you a little bit more and if we can you know change for the better five to ten percent of the education system then that will make five to ten percent of america better you know and then hopefully other countries will adopt it too and it just be a better world incremental you know, yeah think. incremental growth hopefully yeah absolutely yeah. appreciate your work on that thank you. yeah i love um i love your passion for um kind of teaching and uh, education too i mean that's a huge passion of mine as well and i think all of us here you know um mm -hmm. and uh it's so cool for you to be taking what you've learned and just wanting to like give back and help people i think that's like my favorite part about education in general is just passing on knowledge right um yeah. and um, I'm really curious about your kind of work with emotional intelligence. Um, where did that start for you? Was there a particular book or, or person that kind of started on you, started, you know, you on that topic? And, uh, and then do you have any kind of current uh, favorite books or authors or speakers, um, just kind of like uh, resources for you about emotional intelligence? Yeah, for sure. So, I mean, I think it really started um, in college when I was studying uh, cognitive neuroscience because a lot of that was based in linguistics which doesn't sound like it would be about emotional intelligence but then you talk about I had one linguistics course that was about uh, child development and you know how children learn languages and stuff like that and how it's tied a lot to behavior and how it's tied a lot to uh, intrinsic motivation to learn and, and just 
you know, sort of fit in and adapt. You know, it's just like, oh, wow, you know, children hear a million words uh, by the time they're one. So it's just like, how do those words affect how they think and how they, how they right. speak, you know? Um, and then going on to, you know, sort of classes like judgment and decisions, like how do humans make the decisions that they make? You know, is it to benefit just themselves? Is it to, to benefit the world, the people that they care about that are close to or people that they've never seen or will never meet? Um, how are those um, transactions formed? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I read a lot in college and I read a lot in high school. These days, I'm not really reading much literature uh, in, in terms of academics. It's more so looking around you and seeing how things are working, how systems are working now and, and trying to evolve those. I, and I think the big problem is that these systems are profitable for institutions and that they don't want to change them into something that will be less profitable or look less like right. um, monetization for them. Even if it would benefit society down the line, five, 10 years, they want what's making money now. Uh, not yep. to take it into like a, an anti-capitalist point of view, but it's just like, does oh, here we are. Very true, though. <laughs> <laughs> so what you got to face. Um, I just I, I would true, have... though. I mean, that's a yeah. That's an issue, literally uh, across the board in the United States, and I'm in other yeah. capitalist countries too. But how everything that feels like oftentimes the things that we try to do to like help ourselves is some way somehow going to be monetized, mm -hmm. and, um, mm -hmm. and then it just kind of taints it, and it makes it really difficult to actually make change, you know? It does. It does. And if you don't have the capital, then you're sitting here like, I've got all these ideas, and I really want to get these out to the masses, but, you know, let me go work a nine-to-five uh, to make that happen, and then you've lost five, ten years of your life, and you're like, I haven't made any headway on that thing I was trying to do, and then you're, you're dis disheartened, you know, disenfranchised, just like yeah. the rest of America. Not not Jason Ivey, though. Mm -hmm. I'm trying <laughs> not to let that happen. I <laughs> wish I had had more emotional intelligence in my, like, education process. And, yeah, I'd be curious to hear, um, like, a little more about, like, the curriculum you do for that. Because that's a, interesting, like, combining that with, like, a technology. I assume it's, like, a website or an app that kids use. Or <laughs> how does that work? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so, yeah, I can, I can talk a little bit about that. So, if you go to learn the number two strut.com or even just like eq123.com you can actually take a, a diagnostic assessment and, and sort of see how you score emotionally and i like to compare it to something like the myers-briggs um mm -hmm. assessment just because people are so familiar with that like they can rattle off like what their four letters are and i think there's like a dash extension now uh, ENFP. I think I'm like entp a okay all right i'm entp entp a um <laughs> My wife's an INFJ, and so INFJ. Okay. we know is all about the, that. Yeah, yeah. That's the scientist? Mm -hmm. The, the INFJ. INFJ is like the um, withdrawn, like, uh, calculating sounds like the wrong word. Yep. Because it sounds no, like no, negative, I think that is, but yeah. I think I'm like the, I'm the extrovert, like, just like, yeah, spontaneous. <laughs> like, and she's, but she's like rational, logistical, and they're a good match, you know, so yeah, it makes yeah, a lot yeah. of sense. Definitely. Yeah, I mean, so if you if you log on to that, it's free to take. Uh, I'm not trying to like market it or anything or, or you know plug it in, but it's just like that is something that we we broke down into um, five. It was five. It's like the Cassell model of, of five different uh, competencies. We added a sixth, and then we multiplied that by three to break it down into even further you know detailed sub competencies. So you can track your um, your growth and your current assessment first of all in real time. So you take that first assessment, uh, we're trying to cut it down to something manageable. So it's not like 500 questions and you're sitting there for like a day trying to figure out who you are and you're having this midlife crisis, you know, by taking this test. Um, we have, we want to start. Yeah. You can't yeah, make it gotta be like, because you've lost it. <laughs> True. Uh, it's something like 50 or 60 questions. And I think that that can be done in like, you know, half an hour maybe. And then from there you get a score. And you see what your strongest uh, emotional intelligence points are, and also the points that can that we can work. We don't want to say weakest. And then uh, you can take it again as many times as you want to, and it'll also give you tips on how to, you know, go through life and how to apply, uh, you know, foster those and to um, make them your stronger point. Yeah. So that's, that's the basis that's for. Uh, thank you. That's the basis for um, what we're what we're doing in terms of like for the community. That's that's something that's free. That's going to be free forever. It's a diagnostic tool. 
that you can access without you know having to pay anything for and it's not one of those it's like you take the test and then it's like oh to get your results now pay us ten dollars to see this <laughs> like no 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 that's i hate those types of websites yeah but now we're building an app an application that'll be ai based and it'll like you know, cater itself to each student's individual needs and it'll track your progress throughout your lessons and see, okay, like, how are you feeling now? How are you feeling about this subject matter? Do you need a break? And then it'll learn that over time and be like, okay, after 20 minutes, you'll need like a five minute break. Then you want to dive back into what you were focusing on, or then you want to start on a new topic and then, you know, kind of work that around into the first topic. And I think that that type of learning is is a lot more beneficial. I, I think that there are learning specialists out there like at Penn. When I was struggling with these classes, you know, I was taking the most advanced classes I could take there. I, I took, you know, PhD level uh, artificial intelligence courses and I, I had to go to advisors like, how do I study this material? Because it's so dense, like reading two sentences of this stuff is like driving me mad. I, I can't even process what this guy is trying to say about am I a computer? Like, what are they, what are they talking about? And, you know, this, this, <laughs> this one woman was like, okay, so humans actually learn better in chunks. Uh, so if you're taking an hour to study, then you're actually only going to be productive for 40 minutes out of that hour. And you're going to need 20 minutes of downtime to start to consolidate that information and into, you know, something that can be usable later. And like, why are no professors talking about this anywhere? You know, yeah. why did I have to come to you and make an appointment and wait a week to, to see you for you to tell me this like a very useful piece of like information that I could take with me through college mm -hmm. and the rest of my life. So now I'm like, okay, cool. Right. I can like study better, you know, and first of all, and since everything is metrics based and, and how are you performing, um, that's going to, you know, lead me to being a, a better student in, in terms of, you know, academics. Um, mm -hmm. So I could be like, okay, yeah, let me set a 40 minute timer and just read as much as I can and take a 20 minute break. And then, you know, go do something else for a minute and let that information sort of sink in. And I think that that's what this program is sort of built to do. It's just how do you learn as an individual versus um, what do we think you'll learn, you know, or how do we think you'll learn? And, mm. you know, prescriptive versus descriptive, the, that old argument. So, I love it. Like the customization aspect, too. Uh, Two, two quick things about that. My, my dad has worked with the Simmons personal survey for a while, if you're familiar with that at all. It's, it's also um, similar to the MB uh, Myers-Briggs. Um, so I'm, I'm pretty familiar. I think it is based off of emotional intelligence. Dan Goleman is kind of the, <laughs> the guy who wrote emotional intelligence, I want to say 92 early nineties, um, something like that. New York times bestseller about this stuff. And, um, he contributed that material contributed to search inside yourself. We talked to, um, our guest last week was Miru Kim, who is a friend of mine, a coworker at Facebook. She, um, is also a facilitator for search inside yourself leadership Institute, um, which, uh, SIY uses, basically they use mindfulness, emotional intelligence, and neuroscience. And all three of those uh, overlap, so you know, relevant to Jason and, and uh, your, your many mm -hmm. disciplines. But um, yeah, I think that information is super valuable. And uh, you know, I think it also creates self-awareness in um, a lack of which is such an obstacle, um, right? You know, you can't uh, absorb information. Well, why is that? Well, this is actually a you know way to help us unravel some of those questions uh, about mm -hmm. our abilities and, and capacities um, to succeed. So super useful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I know we're it's awesome. Oh, did you? I, uh, did you want to say something, Ryan? Yeah, I just wanted to like yeah. kind of transition a little bit. Um, I and kind of what I've been curious about this entire time is just kind of what your spiritual practice looks like, um, Jason, and kind of. If I, I like, I hear the a lot of the language that you're using. It to me, it, it aligns with a lot of you know my philosophies and kind of uh, feels like you're really just optimistic and really open and just letting the universe kind of take you where it takes you and mm -hmm. and trying to not fight it and just flow with it as much as possible. Um, and to me, that's a very to me the person. It's a very spiritual approach, a very spiritual practice, and I'm wondering what. Yeah, what what you would consider your spiritual practice to look like, um, and if there was any influence, you know, from your childhood, or if it's something that's developed later in life, and um, and yeah, just kind of maybe what your what your feel, you know, what you feel on that. 
Yeah, yeah. so I, I, I think you um, sort of hinted at that question earlier when you were asking, um, where did that mindset, where did that ideology and belief come from? Um, and I had a feeling you're gonna, you know, double back to that because I didn't quite answer it before. Um, <laughs> but I think oh, that good. I, I started off sort of like a, you know, Christian household just because um, my parents were, my mom was like raised Lutheran. She went to a Lutheran school. My dad, it was always in the Catholic churches. And I think that that's something that's prevalent in, you know, communities of color because, you know, faith is such a, a driving force to get you through like these obstacles that, you know, people face on a day to day. Um, but then I, I realized that even these faith-based communities are ex extremely prescriptive. They're like, how to do this. You have to do this this way. You have to be on church at a church like every Sunday. And, you know, you've got to come Wednesday too, if you want to, you know, even extra favor from God. And it's just like, I don't think that's how it works, you know, quite honestly. <laughs> um, and, it, and it got to the point where my younger brother was trying to get into this, this high school, which will remain unnamed, but it's in the Chicago suburban area. And uh, the principal was like, okay, um, mom, brother, nice to meet you. It's, it's good to see that he has, you know, a family support. And we're like, well, what does that mean? And then he's like, okay, but are you, you know, are you religious? And we're like, yeah, you know, we, we consider ourselves to be Christian. And he's like, okay, so are you going to church? And my mom's like, well, I really try to, uh, you know, I try to practice it more than I, you know, attend church. You know, I try to practice it every day. And she's the type of person that if she sees someone in need, she'll go out of her way to help them. Like uh, friends that I've introduced to my mom, she's helped them same day. And, you know, I'm just like, mom, you know, this is my friend, you know, so and so they need somewhere to, you know, stay. They need somewhere to do this. They need a job. And she's like, okay, well, uh, let's see, I have a friend who does this or, you know, there's this building that I know can take this person and, or, oh, maybe they can stay with us until they do this and that, or, oh, are you hungry? Let's go grab some food. And it's just like, that's the type of person that she, she is. Um, so for this principal to be like, are you, you know, can I, if I check your attendance at the church, am I going <laughs> to see that you're there every Sunday? Wow. And she's like, well, no, you, you wouldn't because I, I try to practice it. Bless you. <laughs> I try to practice, That's all the um, information I need. Thank you. Yeah, exactly. You know, she's like, I try to practice it in life. You know, I try to be a good Christian. And he's like, well, if you want your son to come here, then you're going to have to go to church every Sunday. And I'm going to need a written letter from that pastor saying that you were there every Sunday. That's so crazy. Yeah. That's yeah. Insane. And we were sitting here and he was looking at me like, and what about you, young man? Do you go to church? I'm like, I, I'm, I'm busy, dude. Here. Like, I, I don't think God is going to hold it against me, you know what I'm saying? If, I'm, if I miss a Sunday, I'll gonna pray for you, man. I don't know you anymore. Right, yeah. He was just like, no, you're going to have to go Actually, too. This conversation makes me want to not go to church. I yeah, know. I was like, you know, this is ridiculous. And he's like, you know, we're, we're going to need a letter that you were there every. So we literally had to sign an attendance book and say that we were there every Sunday. And I was like, this is wow. just not what I was looking wow. for in, in a spiritual practice. Um, so I ended up picking up a, a bunch of different books about Taoism, about Buddhism, about um, just different ideologies. And I, I, I realized there's a lot of similarity um, between all these different practices at their, at their core. But then when people get involved, it sort of takes a new life. You know, people are like, oh, okay, actually, if you want to be a good Christian, here's 57 different denominations on how to do that. Uh, you know, you can go over there and you can dress like this. You can come over here and you can talk like this and chant that and sing this. And it's just like, but what is that doing for you as a person? What is that doing for society? Um, mm -hmm. So personally, I think that introspection is like the best way to, you know, advance yourself because I mean, someone Absolutely. preaching at you and not, not to say preaching at you or to talk down on like Christian believers, but just someone telling you their personal stories and being like, now apply this to yourself and make that work every, every week, once a week and thinking that that's enough is, not going to take you anywhere i mean it, it got to the point where my pastor was saying the same stories and i could be like okay he's gonna talk about football today and he would he'd wow. be like yeah i was sitting there watching mm -hmm. the super bowl commercials and thinking to myself you know, this red light. <laughs> and i'm like this is not helping me but you're, i think that you're seeing read, the card he's pulling oh yeah and, i'm like okay i i think i know your sermon notes by now um <laughs> i i just think that spirituality is, is sort of like a not it's not a one-size-fits-all thing but I think that there are things that can benefit everyone, like meditation, introspection, mindfulness, something that is becoming increasingly popular these days. Mm -hmm. um, just being in touch with yourself and, and the more in touch with you are with yourself, then the more you can be open to opportunities, just staying positive, you know, just things like that. And I think that in Zen Buddhism and, and certain lines of Buddhism, um, 
there are practices that are they're challenges to yourself you know think on materialism and think on the things that you don't need think on the things that you're you're anchoring yourself to that aren't going to help you in the long run you know that car where is it going to take you after five ten years it's going to break down you're going to need a new one don't get so attached to that um don't get so attached to your own body you know there are things called the graveyard meditations in buddhism where it's just like you sit and you stare at a set of corpses for like hours and then you're just like no think about this being you in a hundred years and you're like <laughs> oh that's extremely dark but then it helps you to elevate to this plane that like people wouldn't get to normally and you're like okay cool so now i know that the things that i do in life have to like go beyond my body they have to go beyond just the people that i'm immediately connected to they have to last a lot longer than i will um or just um this is another one. This is this this happiness challenge. Basically, I don't even know what it's called. It's probably has a, a legitimate name, but um, where monks would sit and try to only think happy thoughts their entire lives, just like nothing negative, not not a doubt in their mind, not you know, oh, it's probably gonna rain today. That sucks. Then you have to start over. You know, just and and <laughs> there is one that I saw where this person literally became light. You know, just sort of wasted away, but like in a good way. And I was like, a lot of this stuff sounds dark out of context, but when you realize that we're not going to be here forever as humans, you know, then you have to think, okay, what impact am I having for the people that come next? Even in educational sphere, you want your people, the, the following generation to be better than you. Otherwise you, you haven't gone anywhere in life. So it's all about continual and, you know, uh, incremental growth, just hoping for the better for yourself and for the people that come after you. And I think that that's a lot of what my spirituality entails. It's just like, how do I get myself to the highest level possible, like period for a human being so that I can be that anchor to like sort of, you know, leverage the rest of my community beyond me. You know, I don't want to be the best person in my community. I don't want to be the best person in my family. I want to be the hallmark, maybe, you know, the, the blueprint for people to recreate that and then make it better, you know, and, and supersede me one day. So. So well yeah, said. Preach. <laughs> Love it, man. Mm-hmm. I think Jason Ivey needs to open his own church. <laughs> no, 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 no. That's all cold. Stuff. <laughs> That's, <laughs> That's the well, old model. <laughs> right, exactly. That's very outdated of you, Ryan. That's a uh, uh, for Jason. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> That was beautiful, man. I, that, was, that was really great. Um, thank, you. thank you for sharing all of that and uh, sharing your views and your yeah your thanks approach for, to th- that. And Thanks for asking yeah, that question. Beautiful. Listening yeah, to oh, a yeah, polymath exactly. describe perennial philosophy and impermanence and the practical application of spirituality, sweet melody to me. Um, <laughs> yeah, same. So thank you. Yeah, and we talk uh, a lot really about perennial philosophy and, uh, you know, how they all overlap. And I think that's mm-hmm. it's uh, that that's what set me off years ago is uh, realizing the connections and the overlap. And it's like all of the stuff that I didn't like was the differences. But all the stuff mm-hmm. I did like, oh, wow, Jesus talks about loving the least of these and praying for, you know, those who persecute you. And Buddha talks about Mm -hmm. loving kindness and, Mm -hmm. you know, radical compassion. And, you know, you kind of go down the list, right, of like all these similarities and parallels. And uh, yeah, it's a beautiful We're like Bob and I are trying to figure out how could we, how could more kids be, be exposed to stuff like this? I wish I uh knew about it earlier than i did i kind of found it out on my own in high school but um especially now it would be incredibly helpful if if some more kids were exposed to these perennial philosophies these things that connect between uh cultures all around the world um i don't know yeah. how but somehow we gotta we gotta get more people into it just <laughs> plant a seed for jason <laughs> <laughs> please do please do i'd love to grow it <laughs> wonderful yeah, thanks yeah, again, I mean, Ryan, for answering that question because I was going to ask Jason a kind of a final question, and we wouldn't have, we wouldn't have got that on the show. Yeah, that would have been a huge travesty. Uh, <laughs> did you want to add anything else, Jason, before our last formulate question? Because I do know you're a busy guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I think that I can answer what books kind of brought me to that that plane of spirituality um, more so than I can answer what books I could read about or, or list about at Muslim intelligence. They were sure, yes. the I Ching, or I guess the I Ching was one of the first books that I picked up. Also, this book called Christianity Before Christ that talks about mm-hmm. just the, the frameworks for Christianity before they even gave it a name. 
and how they've mm. been in practice and in existence for the longest time. Um, and then I think that I just, there's this website that's just a huge depository of just a ton of different Buddhist meditations and um, with instructions and images and stuff like that. And if I can remember that, I'll shoot it to any of you all after the show. But yeah, I think that those are like the first three real books. And then there's another book about Taoism uh, that I didn't, I don't think it had a name um, that I, I read and I was just like, wow, you know, this is, this is great. You know, let me just continue Fantastic. down this path and, and then try to relate it back to Christianity, try to relate it back to um, like the Bible, because that's a lot of people in America's talking points. They're like, well, actually the Bible says this. And you're like, oh, okay, well, if you can quote it so well, tell me what it says in this chapter and tell me how you're applying that in your life. And they're like, well, uh, uh, actually, you yeah. know, I really only focus on this other book. And it's like, well, then don't talk about the whole book then if you're not a practicing Christian. And they're like, mm. and that breaks people's mindsets. You know, uh, someone was talking about how Black Lives Matter is just this aberration. And they're just like, oh, no, like, this is not good. You know, like, Black Lives Matter, you know, no, all lives matter. And I'm like, okay, well, then what about the parable of the sheep in the Bible where Jesus abandoned the 99 sheep to, to chase after the one that was lost? You know, did he, mm-hmm. did he not care about the 99 sheep that he had? Because that's a lot of sheep. Or did he really want that <laughs> one sheep to be a part of the flock to where it can be whole? And then they're like, oh, no, I think that that one sheep was like the, the all lives. And I was like, how are you getting that math? Like, that doesn't even sound right. <laughs> that's a misread. <laughs> Do you know right. They're like, well, let's open through. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> a dodge and deflect. <laughs> She's like, it's open to interpretation. I'm like, no, you just didn't want it. Yeah. That one is a particularly good one to bring up right now. The the 99 sheep one is, is I saw it a few oh, weeks yeah. ago, and I was like, yes, let's circulate this all over social media. <laughs> all over the place. Yeah. Heck yeah, I'm posting that on Facebook like every week. <laughs> yep. <laughs> He has some gems. We talked about this. We had a we did a Christianity episode on Easter. We're all uh, Christian upbringing guys that don't go to church regularly. Um, you know, I, I say that I left the faith uh, really in college, and um, but I but you know, kind of to your point, I I, I found it through the East. Um, you know, Hinduism, Buddhism, yeah, Taoism. Faith. Well, I left, left the Christian, Christian church and institutional faith, Christianity. Yeah. You know, yeah. yeah, it's my 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 personal faith, or like I prefer the word trust. Uh, you know, whatever. There's a lot of uh, form is not uh, as explanatory of the concept as it ought to be. But um, but yeah, no. I mean, the East is a really beautiful window. I think, especially for you know minds like yours. The, you know the the, the east uh, i'm not speaking broadly but um you know those ideologies as a whole tend to be um limitless uh, you know mm-hmm. they have this capacity of like kind of oneness with all that is and like this grandiosity mm-hmm. to them that you know the abrahamics you know no disrespect to to you know two points whatever billion religious people that believe <laughs> particularly christian and islam um mm-hmm. you know there's a lot of believers and and, and most of those people are, are great people and you know just yeah. trying to go to work and raise their kids and buy a sandwich and you know it's like it's mm-hmm. uh, it's unfortunate that there there's some hypocrisy involved and there's some fortunate that even more so that there's you know extremism and barbarism and abuse and so on all of which are tied up into some of those institutional aspects but um but yeah there's a, there's there you know my 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 big point would be that as you investigate these systems and kind of see the broader scope and the full spectrum of uh you know what spiritual paths can offer um mm-hmm. you know it's it's really inspiring and i think it has a lot of value for um for contemplating them and investigating them and and you know you know to jason's point here too you, you know your own self-worth your own self about self-value if you can identify you know your own potential and your own future uh with with uh you know kind of that limitlessness aspect um you know that's that's a good place to be yeah yeah and i think that people should apply that same investigative value uh to education because and and language even um just you know just how linguists are the debate between oh prescriptive and descriptive okay you should only talk this way in english you know you have to speak 
you have to say to whom and not to who. And it's just like, well, it, maybe if that's not serving us anymore, then we should move away from that. And I think that that's the same thing that we should apply to education, that it shouldn't be so prescriptive. You shouldn't have to sit down and write this poem 10 times and then, you know, recite it because what did you learn from that poem other than the words? Are you learning the meaning behind the words? Uh, and I think that it should be, we should move to a more descriptive society that, okay, this is how individuals can learn, how individuals can think, process, and feel. And these are the multiple ways in which that can exist. And I think that uh, once we get there as a society, uh, once we get there, even in terms of social justice issues, like you should act this way and, and carry yourself this way, and you should not be a certain color, then once you realize, okay, we're all, you know, people, you know, let's just be people in the different ways that people can people, you know, just once we get there as a society, then I think that um, a lot of the problems that we've placed on ourselves will fall away uh, and rapidly. And I think that we're getting there. I think that this this time is uh, a melting pot, for lack of a better word, than for what we're trying to create, the dish that we're trying to see. Beautiful. Well said. I completely agree. And, uh, you know, I, have, I share your s similar shreds of optimism despite you know the 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 difficulties in the news and whatever doom scrolling or whatever like you know, I think you're right you're right there is there is this excitement um to you know I, birth pangs kind of is what it is to me it's like mm -hmm. this is this is the difficulty of the transitional phase to you know ideally what a what a fuller more interconnected civilization is mm -hmm. um so Jason, thank you so much, man. We have a lot to uh, kind of reflect on over the next few days listening to this because you've given us a lot of uh, great stuff and, um, you know, it's I'm just terrific to, to meet you. Yeah, yeah terrific to meet you, you and Likewise. learn more about really nice. uh, your mm -hmm. projects. Thank you, thank you. Too. As far as your, your music goes, where can people find you? It sounds like on SoundCloud and maybe on Spotify as well. Yeah, everywhere. SoundCloud, Spotify, Apple cool. Music, title like on, Pandora, even yeah. Okay, so, great. And under the name Jason Ivy. Jason Ivy on social media, the awesome. Jason Ivy, T H E Jason Ivy, yeah, from everywhere. Okay, awesome. Jason, come great. back and talk to us in the future. Give us an update. Yeah, I would love to. Yeah. I would love to. I love to see how like we're all like you know moving through life and where we might be whenever we meet again. Mm -hmm. so. Absolutely. Yeah, likewise. This is an early episode for us, so it'll be fun to yeah. check back in uh, down the line. Yeah, I love being a part of early stage things because, you know, it's just like you were there at the beginning, but let's see mm -hmm. where this can go. Kind of like they yeah. started. And Likewise. <laughs> Next time we meet up, it'll be a real nice studio. Just kidding. I don't hey. know. <laughs> COVID will be over. We were in on Jason <laughs> early. He Please. wasn't in on us early. Awesome. Well, have a good one, man. Thanks so much yeah, for joining. Nice to meet Thanks, you, man. guys. You too. Later. See you all. Take care.